Look, where you have flammability and vulnerability and an extra damage map, and she could not hurt us. Oh yeah, this build is the best. <laughs> I love Arctic Armor. I don't know if I can ever play a non-Arctic Armor build ever again. G'day, Ziggy D here, and welcome to the final build guide for my Ethereal Knives Mind Over Matter Scion, aka my EK Mana Shield Scion. Playing this build, I am currently level 86 in the Nemesis Hardcore League, and although I hate to jinx myself, I feel almost unkillable. I originally designed this build to take full advantage of the Scion's ability to easily branch out across the passive tree so that I could layer multiple powerful defensive mechanics on top of each other. Since this was a new class using a new passive tree, I had no idea of if it would actually work, but 86 levels later, I am extremely pleased with my undying hardcore goddess. If you want to play a build that completely trivializes some of the scariest things in Path of Exile, then this is the build for you. So let's take a look at what makes this character so defensively powerful. The core mechanic driving this build is the Eldritch Battery and Mind Over Matter combo. The Eldritch Battery allows us to get a huge pool of mana, and by extension, a ton of mana regen. A portion of this mana, around 700 to 1000 of it, then acts as our mana shield for the Mind Over Matter Keystone. As long as this mana is there, then all of our incoming damage is essentially reduced by a whopping 30%. Next up is Arctic Armor. This skill gives a flat damage reduction against fire and physical attacks in exchange for a very high mana drain, almost 300 mana per second while moving at level 20. In order to run Arctic Armor 100% of the time, most builds tend to leave it at a relatively low level, something like 10 or 12 or something like that, and they only get a small defensive bonus from it as a result. However, in this build we already have an obscenely high mana regen, so we seek to max level Arctic Armor. In fact, I eventually plan on using Empower to boost its level to level 22 for an even higher defensive boost. The defensive power of Arctic Armor doesn't look as powerful as it is. 319 fire and physical damage reduction at uh, level 20 doesn't seem like a lot when you can get hit for 4,000 life in one hit, for example. However, as you'll see in the background footage, it causes some of the most scary things in the game to simply deal zero damage to us. The multiple projectile tentacle creation I am uh, tanking in the background is actually the map boss from the Poor Joys Asylum unique map, which features a whopping 150% increase in monster damage, that's more than double, and I was also cursed with vulnerability and flammability at the same time. And thanks to Arctic Armor, I take no damage at all. It's pretty insane. It's honestly going to be hard to make builds in the future that don't use Arctic Armor in this. I feel like I've become super reliant on how powerful it is, and uh, maybe we'll be in Nerf Town soon. We'll see. And finally, as if that wasn't enough defensive power, this build also manages to get a very good amount of life. 230% max life from the passive tree at level 90, which should bring us up over a 5,000 life. I have close to this already and I'm only level 86 with not the most perfect gear, so we should be even, even able to exceed it by a little bit. So now let's talk about our main attack skill. It may have seemed a bit weird to focus on the defensive mechanics of the character before even mentioning our attack skill, but that's because this character was designed to be an unkillable, and uh, Ethereal Knives is more of a supplement to that rather than an integral part of it. The reason why I chose EK for this build is that it's extremely efficient and scales really well with limited investment from the passive tree. I currently have almost 7500 DPS on my EK with only a few efficient passive points and gearing choices. When I get my Empower Gem to level 3 and equip a Ming's Heart, this should be closer to 10,000 DPS. For reference, 6,000 DPS is considered pretty decent for EK and viable for endgame. The reason that EK is so efficient and easy to scale is that it has a very solid amount of base physical damage that scales with its level, and this can be greatly enhanced with things like Added Fire and Hatred that scale in percentages of physical damage. The other reason why I really like EK in this build is that it promotes a very safe and defensive playstyle. The damage area of EK is in a cone extending out from the player, so the best positioning is always going to be at a slight range with all enemies grouped in front of you. With this sort of positioning, there is a lot of less potential for your character to be surrounded or hit by many enemies at once. Thanks to stacking a lot of projectile speed, we also have a really good effective range with EK just about to the edge of our screen, which further supports this playstyle. In the end, we have a character where our core defensive and offensive skills and passives all have a lot of synergy with each other, and this has resulted in a build that has fast become one of my favourite hardcore builds I've ever played. So, before we get into the passive tree and gearing in detail, let's talk about some of the supplementary skills you'll see me using. The first is Lightning Warp. 
I have this link to faster casting and the decreased duration support gem, and uh, the lightning warp gem also has some quality on it for increased cast speed. This combination results in extremely effective mobility skill trumped only by Leap Slam with Bright Beaks, I think. I use this skill a lot when farming easier content like doing Lunaris runs and things like that, and it's also super effective in PvP. Uh, it kind of reminds me of the glory days of Diablo 2's teleport where you kind of just like off-screen teleport. That's not quite that powerful. Next up is Enfeeble. This has always been my go-to curse for hardcore leagues, and with all of our other defensive buffs, this is just icing on the cake. However, if you wanted more damage, you could instead run Projectile Weakness or Elemental Weakness on this character. A constant friend on my toolbar is also my decoy Broton. He's currently not linked to anything, but when I can link him to something, I link him to faster casting for increased taunting power. I primarily use this to group up tougher mobs to EK down, or to distract bosses to keep myself extra safe. Next you'll notice that I also have Bear Trap. This is not for single target, as EK actually does far more damage than it, but it is used for magic find culling, which is something I think everyone should do if they tend to farm solo a lot. I simply have the Bear Trap linked to culling strike and the item rarity support gems. Combined with a little bit of rarity gear, I have around 100% rarity on culls, which helps finding a few extra uniques and rare items. The first two auras that I run are Discipline and Clarity. Clarity is leveled as much as possible while we level, and it'll eventually be max level for a lot of extra regen at endgame. Discipline is only possible to run around level 75 and onwards, as it actually reduces your unreserved mana by quite a bit uh, in the earlier stages of the game. The reason why we run it uh, at endgame is because it increases our overall pool of mana by a great amount, and therefore our mana regen by a significant margin as well. For example, Discipline currently drops my unreserved mana by about 100, but it increases my mana regen for, by about 70 mana per second, which is pretty huge and enough for another couple of levels on Arctic Armor. My third aura changes between Hatred and Grace depending on the situation. If I'm going into a scary map with a lot of physical damage, then I'll run Grace for an extra 25% or so physical mitigation. But for the most part, I run Hatred for the damage buff. And then finally, we have my Cast on Damage Taken setup. I currently run a level 6 cast on damage taken gem linked to a level 8 enduring cry and a level 10 molten shell. It's not as strong as it once was, but it's still almost free additional defense, so I take what I can get. And now, let's take a look at my passive skill tree. So here we have my passive skill tree. As I mentioned, starting Scion so we can expand out in multiple directions across the passive tree. We go up the left side into the Templar area of the tree, we go up the right side up towards Eldritch Battery near the Witch, and we'll go all the way down here for Iron Reflexes and Mind Over Matter. So Scion is a natural choice for this build, no other character could replicate it. Now before I forget, because I always forget this, I want to mention what my choices for the Bandit Quests were, and uh, what I think you should take. Originally I took Life, Fizz damage, and then the uh, Endurance charge, all from a Helping Oak throughout each difficulty. However, I highly recommend you guys go for Life, Physical damage, which scales EK, and then instead of the Endurance charge, simply take the passive skill point. Now, the reason I originally went the Endurance charge was because we had the cast on damage taken, proccing our Endurance charges through Enduring Cry. However, since that's been nerfed, I find that I'm rarely actually at, uh, you know, additional Endurance charges. I, I rarely extra need that extra one. So the passive skill point is going to be far more helpful, and you'll be able to spend it on something like Life and Mana here, or Mana Regen down here. So it's going to help out a lot more than that Endurance charge would. So, let's get into this, and I'll try and explain things in the order that I suggest you take them, so that uh, you guys can follow this as a bit of a leveling guide. Now, this tree has undergone significant changes since I originally planned it, so if you've been following my build, sorry you're going to have to spend some regret orbs, but uh, this is all in the name of progress and making a better build, I swear. So, initially, when you first start leveling, I suggest going down through projectile damage and coming up here to get the life. I did initially did this, and we eventually respec out of the projectile damage, as it's less needed in our build. We need less damage nodes and more mana nodes and things like that. So, we come through here and get this excellent life wheel. This has a huge amount of life in it. There's even a 12% life node here. And we also get Path of the Warrior, which gives increased physical damage, which scales EK as well. One of the few nodes that will scale the physical aspect of EK, so that's really cool stuff. Then I think we come up through Shaper to get regen here, and uh, we can eventually reconnect this and, as I said, respec out of these and grab these mana nodes here instead, as uh, these are more powerful for the build as we move towards Ed game. So from here we can head up into the Templar area, we grab the, thick, the Purity of Flesh cluster here. I'll probably uh, eventually get this life node here as well. But we also then head down to the south, grabbing like extra strength and life here for extra armor. These are uh, Body and Soul cluster here and the uh, Faith and Steel cluster give us a lot of extra 
extra mana from the increased energy shield, which gets converted by Eldritch Battery. Also it gives us some additional resistances and armor. This is the only armor we pick up in the build as well, so it's pretty helpful. And we come in here for the super efficient life nodes. This is just what I found to be the most efficient life buffing area, while also getting us some mana, uh, some aura supports and things like that later on. Now I should mention that we won't take any of these aura supports or inner force or anything like that until end game. We take those at level 70 plus, probably maybe 60 plus is the earliest to take this cluster here. So after we've kind of gotten a bit of survivability out of the way and we can potentially even just go up straight as we get this life node and go up to Templar later, we want to rush towards EB. So we're going to head straight up towards Eldritch Batter and get it here. Now again, we're going to leave these mana reservation nodes here and we might get cast speed at this point because cast speed is pretty helpful, but we'll leave these life and mana nodes until later as well. And uh, then they're a nice end game thing to grab. So from there, once we have Eldritch Battle, we, we want to rush down to Mind Over Matter. As soon as we have Eldritch Battle, we can pretty much start running Mind Over Matter. So we'll rush down here as quickly as possible, picking up Iron Reflexes first, going and getting Mind Over Matter, and then getting this excellent thick skin cluster here. So once we've kind of got that out of the way, we want to start picking up, uh, probably I recommend picking up all of the uh, aura supports from that point onwards. It's going to help with being able to run discipline and make your uh, arctic armor able to be leveled up a bit more and uh, make your just mana overall much more effective. And then from that point, we can eventually run, uh, get all of these extra things here like Path of the Savant, these cast speed nodes are nice pick up these extra nodes here, get Inner Force eventually, that's a very late gain optimization. it uh, helps out with a lot of the buffs on us from our auras, but uh, is not particularly helpful before, before something like level 80, I think I got it at level 80. And uh, then eventually we want to work our way towards our life nodes and life and mana nodes here. These are super efficient for us because we uh, use mana as effective HP as well as the life. This is like kind of like a double whammy here and uh, it helps out with pretty much just everything I build. I can't imagine more perfect uh, pure survivability buff nodes than these ones here. So uh, these are the actual the last things I'm getting. I think my build's currently up to here. And uh, working my way towards level 90, I'll just be picking these up. And each one is a huge jump in life and manner. And it's really nice and exciting to be able to get each one of those uh, at endgame. So I think that pretty much covers it. Let's uh, take a look at gearing. So before we take a look at the individual gear pieces and what we should be getting on each one of them, I just want to say that I originally created this character as my first character in the new Nemesis League. That means everything that this character has now was earned by this character through farming and trading. I didn't do any sort of flipping or anything like that. So that gives you a good idea of this character is possible to do self-found and self-traded without having a huge existing stash of wealth. It does not need a bunch of different uniques. In fact, the only unique I used was the uh, unique Jade Amulet Karui reward for the extra projectile speed while leveling. In fact, I used that until something like level 70 before I finally got my spellcast amulet here. So pretty cheap to uh, get this character going and get it into endgame. Sure, you can spend a lot optimizing your endgame gear, which is I'm starting to do now. Things like the six link are pretty expensive and uh, things like buying a Ming's heart ring is very expensive as well. But it's entirely possible to do this character just with the things you find for this character. Uh, it's not the simplest build to our uh, gear. You have to put a fair bit of consideration into the certain stats, but it's also not the hardest and it doesn't require a bunch of expensive stuff. First thing I want to talk about is the wand and amulet combination. These two things I combo together because you have to upgrade both of them at the same time. Originally I ran a Karui Ward amulet for a very long time. This amulet purely just gives us projectile speed and this is crucial to making EK effective as you can see. My EK kind of shoots just, just to the edge of my screen now which is about optimal. You don't want really much less than that. And uh, in the early game the Karui Ward is the best way to achieve this. Now the reason I group this up with the wand is because you can only upgrade out of the Kuri Ward once you get a wand with projectile speed. Now I recommend going for one with 30 plus projectile speed, but you could get by with 20 plus. So uh, this one here has 34%. Once I got this wand finally, I was finally able to drop my Kuri Ward and get a nice spellcast amulet here. Those were That was a very happy day for me. So let's talk about the rest of this wand. You want spell damage, pure spell damage is going to help outscale EK a lot. We don't get a lot of spell damage in this build, but the stuff we do get helps out quite a bit. Let's actually see if I can remove this down from 7,300 to 5,200 from the wand there. Now we also get cast speed. Cast speed makes EK much more uh, enjoyable to use especially, but it also makes it much more effective and has big DPS increase because the base cast speed of it is pretty low. And then projectile speed is the other essential on that. If there's one other stat I could get on this wand, it would be mana regeneration as this this is a huge stat in this build, and uh, unfortunately that boosts the cost of the wand by something like 10 exalts. So <laughs> we go with this wand, and for our memory, this wand cost, uh, I think it was a 
less than one exalt. It must have been 10 or 15 chaos if I remember correctly. Next thing is the amulet. We go for spell damage, cast speed, same sort of deal, and mana regeneration as much as possible. Now you'll notice I pretty much just have offensive and supplementary stats like this on it. Don't have any defensive stats on that, and because I had already optimized my character to be defensive enough while running the crew reward, which have no, which has no defensive stats on it. So it's pretty nice that you can just upgrade straight to a perfect uh, spell cast amulet for this. This was pretty cheap. This was only about 10 chaos, and uh, pretty nice for an end game amulet. The mana regeneration is especially important. So I'll take this second to talk talk about why this is super important, this mana regeneration stat, and why you want to get as much of it as possible on your gear. This actually scales the mana regen not only from our base mana regen, but also the mana regen provided by the Clarity Aura. So for example, taking this off, this has uh, this has a tiny bit of mana on it and a bit of intelligence, but that's not going to make a big deal, but with, oh wow, level 91 has died at position 8, wow, that's a, whew, that's pretty rough. Anyway, oh, that's a, that always makes me real a little bit when I see people from the top 20 die like that. Anyway, uh, we'll take this off. 45% mana regeneration brings our regen down from 270 to 220. A big change. It, it scales so well getting some of this on your gear. We want to try and get as much of that as possible. So the amulet's a nice place to get that. Next up, let's talk about the shield. My shield is a terrible example because it's exactly what I don't recommend you get. However, I cannot find a way to stop using this shield. Look at the stats on this thing. It is perfect. It's got... A very high life roll, very high mana roll, and a very, almost perfect resist rolls as well. It is insane, and it even has lightning gems on it, so I can up my lightning warp, make it a little bit uh, faster to use. So uh, I can't find a way to get rid of this shield. However, I recommend you guys go for spell damage, cast speed, and mana regeneration on your shield in addition to defensive stats. Especially try and get a high base energy shield shield. Now the reason why we're using a pure energy shield shield here is it's going to be a huge mana buff for us. Unfortunately, I have a very low level base here. I can't, I can't upgrade from it because it has these whopping stats on it, but I really wish I could because I would love to run something like a shield with 200 plus energy shield on it. it would give me so much more mana, but I managed to get by with just this, and uh, the defensive stats on it are just too powerful for me to give up. But try and get one with regen, lots of mana, lots of energy shield, lots of spell damage and things like that, and it'll be a nice buff for your build. Next up, we have the rings. Pretty basic stuff. I try to go for mana regen. I primarily will have this one because it has uh, life and mana regen on it and also a very nice energy shield roll. Energy shield rolls obviously help out a fair bit with mana, and you'll see that my mana regen changes a lot when I take this off as well. And uh, also my base mana should change by yeah, about, about 80. It's not a big deal. The energy shield isn't a big deal. Mostly it's the regen and a bit of extra life, and it has some rarity on it too. Nothing, nothing crazy good here. This is probably like uh, less than 5 chaos. Next up we have this uh, Amethyst Ring here. I'm trying to run a bit of Chaos Resist on my gear. You eventually want to get some of that. And this just has some basic stats on it. It's really not that special. The reason I'm not, I haven't upgraded this yet is I'm actually saving up for my end game ring and this will be the only really good unique I get for this build and that is Ming's Heart. Ming's Heart gives you 20% uh, of your physical damage as added chaos damage. Now that doesn't, you know, isn't blockable by armor, it isn't resistible by resists unless they have like a chaos resist which is pretty uncommon, and uh, it isn't reflectable. So it's going to be a huge damage increase, a huge 20% damage increase, uh, and that's going to be unblockable, unreflectable. It's going to be a huge buff for my character, and it's also going to give me a lot of chaos resist. It does have some drawback in terms of life and mana, but we should be able to support that pretty, uh, pretty easily in this build. Currently on Nemesis, they're going for around 8 to 10 exams. So I've got a little bit of saving up to do. I'm almost there. But uh, that's the only endgame unique I recommend shooting for. Next up, we have our belt, Eagle Snare Rustic Sash. We wanted to use a Rustic Sash because the implicit mod physical damage increase affects EK, so I've got a 22% one here, and this is a big damage buff for EK as well. If I take this off, we go down to 6,900 from 7,400, so pretty nice buff there. Otherwise, just get defensive stats on it, and obviously energy shield gives us more mana. For our boots, uh, move speed is recommended, but not compulsory. Move speed increases the speed that we lightning warp at, so with this on, I'm going to lightning warp around much faster, and uh, it also helps with repositioning for EK, so I do recommend going for move speed. Otherwise, just get your normal life and resist and all that gear. We go for armor energy shield because the energy shield uh, gives us increased mana, obviously, and uh, the armor still gets us, lets us get a little bit of armor. I find it easier to run armor energy shield than evasion energy shield, even though we have iron reflexes, because... Uh, it's easier to roll the right color sockets. You notice we have two blue, one red, and one green here. Getting this on an evasion energy shield would be slightly harder. Not, not incredibly hard, but slightly harder. 
Same deal with our gloves, we pretty much just go for defensive stats on this and an armor energy shield base uh, with as much armor and energy shield as possible on these. Now the helmet is basically the same deal as well, just defensive stats on here. You could get intelligence here, it will help you out a bit, uh, any, any extra mana and things like that are always helpful. Uh, otherwise. Uh, on my mana, on my sh helmet, sorry, I like to run my uh, cast on damage taken setup. Although this could work on any of these, because it's pretty easy to roll four reds on this. I currently only have three reds since I only have this three link, and I'm running decoy totem by itself on self cast now. So now let's talk about the chest. Before I got a 6 link, I ran the worst possible 5 link. It had something like 50 life and 10% resist on it. And I ran this for a long time. And uh, you want to get armor ES or evasion ES on your chest. They're both pretty easy to roll. Uh, it's... On a 5 link, it's not a big deal because we only have, on a 5 link, this is our current setup, we take off Iron Will. So we have 2 green, 2 red, and a blue. It really doesn't matter which base type you get. But uh, just run a terrible 5 link. Make sure you do get a 5 link because it's super important for uh, EK. On our EK setup, we run Faster Casting as our 5th link. So a 4 link would be Life Leech, Faster Projectiles, Ethereal Knives, and Added Fire. Not bad, but Faster Casting adds a huge amount of damage to that. So it brings us up to 6-6 six, six there. And then Iron Wheel is our 6 link, six link. Eventually it will be Empower. Once Empower hits level 3, we'll switch that out. But for now, Iron Wheel gives us more damage on our 6 link there. So you want to run the worst possible 5 link until you can get a 6 link. And even then, if it's a bad 6 link like this one isn't particularly special, uh, this is pretty good too. We get a lot of energy shield off our uh, base chest armor though. So try and get a high eye level 1 as possible as you can. A high base item level. Uh, as, as possible. So the final thing to talk about is flasks. Now uh, these are pretty these are pretty important. We want to run at least one insta heal, so either a bubbling or seething. Uh, I have immunity to curses on this. I'd recommend having immunity curses somewhere in Nemesis. It's very helpful, but uh, on the life flask is actually the worst, especially on the insta heal life flask because it has no duration essentially. So it doesn't help. It just removes a, a curse. It doesn't uh, keep the curses away, which I would much prefer to have that on another class flask like my jade flask. However, the reason I don't have it on my jade flask is because look at these rolls. 20 plus extra charges, 99% increased evasion. This is almost perfect, this flask. I can actually use it twice before it runs out of charges and it uh, increases my evasion by a huge amount. Let's actually use this now. Without grace, it uh, increases me up to 59%. So with grace, I almost cap out my physical mitigation on that jade flask there. So very nice to run. Jade flask is preferable to granite flask, but granite flask works fine as well. I use my next flask I use as my utility flask is a quartz flask of adrenaline. This gives us some move speed boost, so we use it kind of in place of a quicksilver. It's less fast than a quicksilver, but it allows us to not get desynced. Your movement is not blocked by enemies. This means you can run through enemy mobs without desyncing, and uh, sometimes if you are desyncing, using this will actually help you resync as well, instead of, you know, using OOS if you're kind of moving around a lot. And it's a, a fantastic escape. If you're in danger, you use this. You can get on the other side of the mobs and then EK them down, use your decoy totem, all sorts of things. Really good flask to run permanently on my toolbar now instead of Quicksilver Flask. I run one insta heal seething uh, hybrid flask here. Obviously hybrid is very helpful for our build. Hybrid's not helpful in many builds, but because we have mana shield, if our mana is taking a beating, if we're taking a lot of damage, our mana will start to go down. We have a ton of mana regen, so this doesn't happen often. But uh, if we're in a very bad situation, then we want the mana and life to both be healed so we get that 30% damage reduction back. So uh, this is helpful to have at least one of these. Now I also have re removes bleed on this since this is my panic flask and uh, if you have nasty bleed stacks from corrupted blood or if you've been punctured then uh, having that on your panic button is very very good. Next up we have just a, a longer term heal if we're taking pretty consistent but uh, smaller amounts of damage and it's keeping our life down then we use this to get to keep it up and I also have dispels shocked on this as well which uh, shocks probably the only one that's more dangerous. Burn and freeze aren't too bad in this build I, have, I haven't found and uh, burn especially is not a danger because we pretty much take no fire damage thanks to arctic armor. So that pretty much covers all of the essentials of this build. If you want some additional information, there will be a link to an official forum thread for this build in the description below. But I just want to take a second to thank you guys for your input and help on this build. Your, uh, you guys have played this build, you guys have given me feedback about it and suggestions, and I've spent something like 50 uh, regret orbs on the passive tree for this character, revising and testing things, and a lot of those suggestions have come from you guys saying things like, you know, why don't you go this way, you could get this, or maybe this would work, and I thought I'd test it out and it actually ends up working really well, so the character is very different from when I initially planned it, and that's all thanks to you guys. So, this build is as much yours as it is mine, and I want to thank you guys for all of that help, and uh, hopefully you guys enjoy the EK Scion Menace 
shield tank because it is pretty awesome and uh, if you want to get yourself into the hardcore leagues then this is probably going to be a great build to do it with. Anyway, that's it for now. I'm Ziggy D and thanks for watching.